are live. Hey, we're back. We're back. And I have with us Amy Allen, um, all the way from Albuquerque, New Mexico, my sister from the <laughs> So, hey, girl. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so good to have you. So, tell us a little bit about yourself, Amy. Okay. Um, well, uh, born and raised in Nebraska, but have lived in Albuquerque for the last 10 years, married to a naval officer who's retired. We have two um, children, two little girls, uh, well, they're not little anymore, Alila, who's 15, and Zoe, who's 12. And uh, my husband and I have a pretty dramatic testimony, which you'll be hearing in my talk, um, but uh, the Lord can do anything. And I just want to encourage people that nothing is too hard for him. Nothing is impossible for the Lord. So um, uh, it's, I re pre-recorded this so you all can watch it. And I'd love for you to answer any questions you have after. So I hope you, hope you enjoy. Amen. So if you do, if you're in the workshops, you have a screen here where you could put your comments in um, the comment section in the chat or in the Q&A. And um, also, we're going to be screening Facebook Live, so um, that question can possibly be pulled over to ask Amy later. But she is very humble. She is the um, director of the Real Conference that she holds um, every year in Albuquerque, and powerful. She'll tell us more about that later. But um, how many years did, have you been doing that conference, Amy? Um, I think we're on our. We've done it six times, and. It was amazing because the Lord, um, this year is my 50th birthday and it was gonna fall on the conference. And as you know, how um, exhausting and you pour everything into it. So I asked for a year of, we're calling it a year of Jubilee where we're just um, you know, praising the Lord and, and celebrating all that he's done in our lives. And so prior to COVID, um, I felt led to that we weren't going to do it in 2020 and look how the God, God already knew. So our next yeah. one's March 13th of 2021, Lord willing. So. Lord willing, maybe I can come. I'm yes, and um, I'm gleaning from you and all that you're learning from this, and we want to live stream it as well as have it live, so. Awesome, awesome. All right, so we are going to watch Amy's um, story, so I think we're ready to go. Okay, I'll cut, I'll cut off. All right. Hello everyone, my name is Amy Allen, and today I'm going to be talking to you about standing for marriage. And you may wonder why I have any um, experience with this. <laughs> I've been married uh, 28 years, and I have kind of a dramatic testimony, so that might not be the case for some of you listening in. You might have a, a wonderful marriage and just need some uh, reminders or maybe your marriage is on the rocks. Um, I've experienced uh, deep hurt in my marriage, uh, but God redeemed it and I've now been married 28 years uh, to my high school sweetheart and we have two beautiful children. And it, I'll tell you a tiny bit about it because I mostly want to get into this talk and be able to share with you some things I've learned. So it's less about me, more about you, more about what God can do in your marriage. Um, so to break it down and to be really blunt, and I'm sorry if this is hard for people to hear, but um, I filed for divorce at year eight because my, I found out my husband had going, been going to prostitutes and uh, for about a year and a half without me realizing it. And prior to that, I had forgiven him for online chats, sexual chats, and then um, also for having an affair uh, right under my nose without me realizing it until later. So I was done. I filed for divorce and had no intention of ever speaking with him again. But God uh, used that time. He actually held back the paperwork. Um, we never, the divorce never was finalized, but uh, God got a hold of my heart and God got a hold of my husband's heart separately. We were on opposite coasts. Um, he was in Maryland, I was in uh, San Diego, and um, it was that time apart, six months of separation 
that God started working in our lives and showing us who he really is, who God is. And we ended up both surrendering our lives to Jesus and to giving him our whole lives. And, uh, and from there, God then started putting our marriage back together. And it was, it was hard work. It took a lot of um, time, effort, hurt, pain, tears. Uh, um, but over time, God has done a remarkable redemption in our marriage. And that's what we like to share with others is what he's done. You know, we don't consider ourselves counselors, but we consider ourselves um, someone who can show others what only Jesus can do. So that's my hope for you is that out of this talk, you'll get some hope and help and healing um, in your marriage. I like to give real practical tools to people um, so that they can find real and lasting change and healing in their lives and marriage. So that's, uh, that's my testimony in a very small nutshell. If you want to hear more about it or, or look into it more, we have a website called aredeemedmarriage.com. And we had um, our testimony on the 700 Club. Um, I've had blogs on the 700 Club. Um, I give away um, my book that I've written for free. So you can ask for that through our website or just hear more of our testimony that way. So uh, again, it's just, that's it in a nutshell. But what I really want to get into is the meat of this and, and tell you more about what can happen in your own marriage through the Lord. Um, what I've learned first and most importantly is that marriage is a covenant. You know, we often in our world, we go into it thinking it's a contract. If you do this for me, I'll do this for you. And, and, and that's not the way it works. And that's not God's intention. It's a covenant first and foremost with him and then with your spouse. And it's about relationship. It's not about rules. You've probably heard rules without relationship lead to rebellion. And that's very much the case in marriage. So if we don't already know um, why we're in a marriage and that we're there to honor God and that he's going to use our marriages to teach us more about life, uh, what the lessons he wants us to learn, which is... Um, forgiveness, uh, selfless love, and sacrifice. So if you've never heard this before about it being a covenant rather than a contract, um, there's a really good book called Sacred Marriage by Gary Thomas, and he really addresses this, and, and that marriage is more about making us holy rather than happy. So that's kind of an umbrella of marriage and its purpose. Now I'm going to get into... 10 things that um, you can do to strengthen your marriage, especially if uh, you've been hurt, if there's been betrayal, if, um, if, if it just needs a tune-up. Uh, these are the things I've learned over time. So the first thing I think is really, really important and something that I needed to learn early on in my life that I didn't understand is know your worth. So number one is know your worth. And that's we need to understand how much God loves us and that our worth is in him, not for what we do, but because we are his. And if you're not God's child yet, if you don't know the good news that Jesus came and died for your sins so that you could be with God the Father forever in eternity with him, um, please contact me and I can tell you more about what that means. But we need to know so even if we've made that step and we are Christians and we are in saved by the blood of Jesus, uh, we need to understand our worth. And it's not about what we do. Now it's not about um, jumping through hoops and how much can we do for the Lord, but that understand our worth in him, that he created us, he loves us, he called us for his purposes, and that he loves us where we are and too much to leave us where we are. Um, so if you don't understand your love, his, his love for you, um, there's some things that you can really look into. I um, love, uh, uh, it's by Neil Anderson, and he, he says, um, it's, uh, it's who I am in Christ. 
and I can share those that resource with you. But they're truths from the Bible of who we are in Christ, and we can repeat them to ourselves, say them out loud, um, put them up all over our house to remind us of our worth in in Christ. And um, another thing I, I've come across recently is a spoken word by um, Kina Kina Aragon, and uh, it's called "What's a Woman's." worth and i can share that with you as well um for in my own life i didn't understand this and it was part of what was crippling our marriage because i was seeking attention in all the wrong places using alcohol to make me the center of attention uh trying to get attention from guys um and i brought this into our marriage uh, i also thought it was based on um good grades was when I was in school or how much money I made in my career as a graphic designer, I thought that defined my worth. And so it wasn't until God showed me who I am in him that a lot of my issues went away um, once I really, really understood that. So that's, that's number one. That's the most important is to know your worth, know your worth in Christ. That way everything else can be built on that in your marriage. If you aren't trying to get your worth from your husband or um, then and only in Christ, you're going to be stronger and it's going to make the marriage stronger. So number two is make Jesus your rock. You know, so often when we get married, we, we tend to um, put all our hopes and dreams and, uh, and make our husband our foundation. And uh, God loves us too much to uh, let us do that. He wants Jesus to be our rock. He must be the firm foundation on which our marriage is built. Um, no one else can take God's place, and, and he won't let anyone else take his place. And that's super important to understand um, because that's what our foundation of marriage needs to be on. Um, so we need to seek him and know him intimately and get to under get to know him through his word and that was something that god really showed me i didn't know i didn't have a relationship with jesus i didn't know him i didn't understand his word i didn't understand his truth and uh he allowed me to take um an in-depth precept bible study um that's by k arthur and it was a story of joseph and through that, I started to understand that um, I have to just put my trust in God and people, my spouse, people will let me down, but um, God never will. And he has a plan, even in the darkest moments of our life, the toughest things, he has a plan and a purpose through that. So we need to make him our rock and we can do this by um, getting into his word and we can, there's so many studies Bible studies where we can really, really get to know who God is and um, an increase in uh, that relationship with him so that uh, everything else flows from that, from that relationship with him. When we have that correct, our marriages um, will be stronger. When Jesus, we make Jesus our rock and not our husbands. You know, we are, our spouses will let us down time and time again and uh you know that betrayal that i felt with my husband's infidelity and him going to prostitutes was was absolutely devastating and until i got grounded in the lord and um and god's word and again my understanding my worth um i i anything that my husband did would would cause me to stumble or to um have heartache all over again but once i got stronger in the lord and understood that um he is my foundation um i can trust him no matter what that then translated to um, a stronger marriage because i wasn't trying to put all this pressure on tim to be someone to be someone that he couldn't be to be god in my life he couldn't do it um and so it took the pressure off my husband, and then he was able to grow in his relationship with the Lord because I was trusting in God. And sometimes people say to me, how can you trust your husband after what he did? And I tell them, I, I, I don't. I mean, I still don't fully put all my trust in him. I put my trust in the Lord, um, and, and I trust what God is doing in my husband's life. And I can see the fruit from it now. I can see the fruit. Um, 
but I don't put my trust in my husband or our marriage. I put it in, in Jesus, in Christ alone. Um, that's where my trust lies. And from there, everything else is built up. Um, a really beautiful um, verse comes out of Jeremiah um, 17, uh, 5 through 8. And it says, um, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. And again, that's Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. And, and again, encouraging you to put your trust in God alone. And that's where you will flourish. So the third thing I want to share with you is see your spouse from God's perspective. And we can ask for God's help with this. Um, and when we, when we look at our spouse from God's perspective, it helps give us more um, compassion. It helps us to see their hurt. Um, it helps us to see beyond our own hurt and see where they're coming from, where their hurts are. Um, you know, my husband came from a really uh, dysfunctional family. His father was, I would say, abusive. Um, always, it didn't have a, a relationship with him, didn't, didn't share anything much except um, disapproval and uh, anger when my husband did something that he didn't, that his father didn't like. Um, so he grew up with that and he grew up with that conditional love. He didn't really understand um, what it meant to be loved unconditionally. And uh, when I started to pray and ask God to see me from, see my husband from his perspective, it helped me have more empathy for what he, what he grew up with and came from and uh, how he looked at life, um, how he experienced life, um, how he would, would be hard on himself. Um, and it helped me have more empathy and understanding. You know, there was a time where we lived in uh, Bangkok, Thailand for two years, and it was there that I had uh, a miscarriage. And it, it was so hard, I mean, if any of you have experienced it, you know what that what that feels like. Is that that loss of life? You knew you had that life in you, and now it's gone. And I was just, I was, I was devastated. I was crying out to the Lord. I was um, so hurt. And I and I reached out to my husband for for help. And he didn't he didn't know he didn't know how to comfort me. He didn't know how to how to help. And as I prayed about it, I mean, that made me feel worse, obviously. And, and of course, I wanted to lash out at him and say, why can't you understand? But God showed me that um, we were living in Bangkok, Thailand, and my husband's struggle was with uh, sexual sin. And here we were in one of the sex capitals of the world where it's just thrown in his face all the time. And he was in his own hurt. He was in his own struggle and depression and when God showed me that it helped me have empathy and realize that um, my husband didn't even have enough to help get to for him to get through everything that he was going through in fact I found out later that he would pray every day and ask God to uh, that he wouldn't wake up the next day that's how hurt and depressed he was so I believe at that time the depression that I felt through the miscarriage God was opening my eyes to how much pain he was in on a daily basis. And so when I, when I saw my spouse from God's perspective, it helped me have empathy rather than getting more anger and um, righteous, self-righteousness, you know, trying to force my husband to be there for me or be something that he couldn't be at the time for me. Um, so it's really important to ask God to have the ability to see your spouse from his perspective to see what's going on in their lives as well, rather than just the hurt that we're experiencing ourselves. So number four is um, work on yourself. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is a hard one, but you know there's always um, 
so much to do, you know, look at ourselves in the mirror and see what we need to work on. Ask God to reveal our sin, to reveal things that we're struggling with that are holding back um, the fruitfulness or this uh, in our marriage. Um, we often want to look at the other person and point out all their sin. I know I did. I was really good at it. Um, I would, you know, tell everyone in the mailman what my husband was doing and uh, not see the sin in my own life. Um, and so if we can ask God to uh, show us our own sin, you know, my, in my life it was, um, like I shared a little bit, using alcohol to make me the center of attention, um, using that to bring attention to myself. I had done that since I was uh, 13 years old, and um, that's how I met my husband and came into the marriage was I would drink to excess every weekend um, from age 13, 14, 15 on. Um, my parents didn't know. Um, I had good grades. I hit it well, but I was doing it every weekend, and, and there were only three outcomes. I would either pass out, throw up, or black out every single weekend, and my husband now, who was my boyfriend at the time, would uh, would take me home and have someone else follow him in the car because it was that it was that extreme and there were a few times when I almost died and I didn't see it as a big deal even coming into the marriage I was like what everybody you know people party hard I don't it doesn't affect my grades it doesn't affect my work I'm still a nice person and uh, you know I just kind of shoved it away and didn't really think much of it but God helped me um, look at that in my life and he helped me overcome that and again that was through especially through showing me that my worth is in him but um i had a lot of self-righteousness in my life that the god that god had to deal with um you know make, thinking i'm better than my husband i'm better than others um i was a major people pleaser you know going out of my way to make sure i pleased others but not realizing i wasn't pleasing god um, I had pride, a lot of pride. God had to humble me. That's a whole other story. But so there's plenty. Oh my gosh, there's so much I need to work on. So I've learned how important it is to ask God to help. And what sin do I have in my life, Lord? Where do you need me to, what, you, what do you need to, what do I need to confess to you to get rid of, to, um, and, and help me to overcome in this area and, uh, and, and be a better person and be a better spouse. Um, so work on yourself. And uh, one thing you can ask yourself, this is a really hard question. Uh, would you want to be married to you? Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. But um, we need to be honest about our own shortcomings and sin. We can't just keep, we can't just look to the other person and, and try to fix them. There's so much God has wants to work on with us. So number five is then pray earnestly for your spouse. And I have to say, if you have not taken this step, then you have no right to keep complaining to your husband, to, to the Lord about your husband. You must be praying earnestly for your spouse. And this isn't Lord, fix them. Hurry up and fix them. It's not that kind of prayer. It's, um, it's how, it's how um, God can bless their lives, how we can specifically pray for certain things. Like if their job is really stressful, we can, we can ask our spouse, how can I pray for you? How can I, um, what are you struggling with? What, how can I be a blessing to you by praying for you? Um, if you've ever heard of the, if you've never heard of this book, it's called The Power of a Praying Wife by Stormy Omarchian. And um, it's really helpful and it helps, it leads you through 31 days of praying for your spouse each and every day, a different type of prayer, a different area of their lives. And it doesn't let, it, it, it also helps you address your own sin, which I just talked about in, the, in, in number four. Um, so it, it's really, really well done and well balanced and it really will help um, open to your eyes to some of the struggles that your husband might be going through and how you can specifically pray for him. Um, you know, in the Bible, the, it tells us that uh, we're to pray for those who persecute us and 
bless those um, who who harm us basically bless those who curse us pray for those who persecute us and and this is uh one of the hardest things that you'll ever be asked to do is that when you've been hurt um don't lash out in anger and vengeance um trust god to and pray and ask god to <clears throat> make those changes in yourself and your spouse and uh try to be a blessing and not make it worse by, uh, I don't know, you know, by coming after them and coming back at them. So if, if uh, it's, it's so important to be able to pray earnestly for your spouse. <clears throat> Excuse me. Number six is break down walls. And what I mean by this is that we must be willing to be vulnerable. You know, when we've been hurt and, hurt like I have. I, I didn't even realize that I had um, built up a wall. I, I was making myself um, protected, I thought, from more harm and more hurt from Tim. But what I was doing was not sharing all of me because I'd been hurt, so I didn't want to be hurt again. So I was really scared to be hurt. Um, so I, it was, again, when we were in Thailand, God showed me um, through a book called, um, let's see, The Sacred Romance, I believe. And it was um, about our intimate relationship with the Lord. And God was showing me that I had um, built up uh, a wall between my husband and I, uh, I because I didn't want to be hurt again. But the very intimacy that I was longing for with my husband, you know, those those heart-to-heart -heart talks, those sharing all of myself, um, and all I wanted him to share all of him, um, that couldn't happen because I had built up a wall. So God showed me how I needed to break that down in order to have the intimacy with my husband that I, that I so desperately wanted. And how he did that was um, one day we were, we were reading the books in bed, and I was reading that book I was telling you about, and, and that's when God showed me very specifically and so i god was telling me to um basically um tell tim that i was giving him my heart again that i that i that i realized i had built a wall and that i didn't want that between us so and i was scared i was like fighting with god in my head no i'm not going to tell him that why don't you do why don't you tell him to, to you know it, he's the one that hurt me and why do i have to do this and god was saying well i've got your attention and i'm asking this of you and it was a way that i was learning to be more obedient to the lord and do things that were hard that he was asking of me so i turned to tim and i and i told him i said um i'm really scared right now but i feel like god is telling me to um give you my heart again and that i had built i've built a wall between us and that i'm not i'm not um, sharing all of myself with you. And so I said, um, I said, symbolically, here is my heart. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it to you, please, please treat it well. And he, thankfully, he realized the, you know, how um, momentous this occasion was. And he said, you know, I, I will, and I'll, I'll do everything. I'm not going to do it perfectly. But um, thank you. And I will do my best to to love you the way that God wants me to love you. And it was a really special and sacred moment. And it had a good outcome for me. I realized that many will, you know, they might do this and they might be open again and they might get their heart trampled on all over again. But what I can share is that um, whatever God asks of us, we need to do. And that's how we're obedient to the Lord. Um, you know, Jesus was so vulnerable with his disciples and they uh, betrayed him. They denied him. They, they crushed him with their actions. And, and yet he never uh, built a wall between them and said, okay, you're done. I'm done with you guys. Um, you keep failing me. And so it's over. He just continued to be vulnerable and open and transparent, um, even to the point when he was dying on the cross and saying, Lord, forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. Um, and, you know, God is asking us to, you know, not be foolish with uh, that vulnerability, but when he calls us to, in his time, to be open and vulnerable with our spouse again, we need to do that because we might have built walls that will 
keep us from ever having the intimacy that we long to have with our husbands. And whatever your husband does in, in, in response to, to this um, is up between him and the Lord. If he's sinning and uh, crushing you yet again, he has to answer to the Lord for that. But we have to answer to the Lord for what God is calling us to do. And um, building walls uh, and protecting ourselves rather than letting God be the protector um, will just inhibit that uh, relationship from growing and increasing in intimacy. So number seven is to be humble. And what I mean by this, I kind of touched on, uh, don't act um, spiritually superior to your husband. I struggled with this. I was like, I'm getting this faster than him. He's not learning from the Lord, you know, and, <laughs> and, and that's part of why I was, you know, when I was building the wall, I was becoming, um, I, I was like, well, he doesn't have anything to teach me. I can't learn from my husband. He's not following the Lord as closely as I am. You know, all these things I was seeing. And, uh, I, I wasn't, I was, I was getting prideful again and we can't, we can't do that. I have to, I had to, um, I had to confess that that sin and uh, humble myself again before the Lord. Um, you know, we all, the ground is level at the cross. And even early on, God showed me that um, sin is sin is sin. It's not rated on a scale of one to 10, um, like uh, I, we would do in the world. But um, my sin of, of uh, angerness or bitterness and unforgiveness is just as grievous to the Lord as uh, Tim's sin of infidelity. Um, and so, you know, in Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we all um, fall short of, of God's plan for our lives. Of, we all sin. And so we need to um, recognize that, uh, be humble. Don't uh, don't think we're more spiritually superior than our husbands. Um, once I broke, once I, God helped me break down the wall um, between my husband and I, I suddenly started seeing things that that I could learn from my husband. Wow, he suddenly got. I don't think he suddenly got smarter or more intelligent overnight. I think it was that uh, I humbled myself and realized that uh, God was working in each of our lives. So number eight is probably the hardest, and uh, that's to forgive. Now, forgiveness does not mean to forget or to um, condone someone's behavior. Um, as a really wise um, friend of mine and a biblical counselor taught me, it's like taking that person off of your hook and putting them on God's hook for God to deal with. It's between them and the Lord, their, their sin. Um, because, uh, you know, something that really drove this home for me, this point home was reading, um, about the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18. And, uh, that if you read, through, I highly encourage you to read through it. And if you really read through it and contemplatively and really ask God to show you something, you'll see that, um, when we withhold forgiveness, because God has forgiven so much in our lives. When we withhold it, it's a, a, we're the ones being tortured. And you've probably heard that, you know, um, not forgiving is like drinking poison and hoping the other person that hurt you is the one that dies and you're the one drinking the poison. It just, you know, God realizes that uh, he has forgiven us of so much. He, he commands us to forgive um, for our own good too. Um, and so that there can be true healing. You know, um, the other part of that is the person that hurt you, if your spouse betrayed you, um, there needs to be true repentance. And that, um, that you can see the difference between just saying they're sorry and then the actions continue and that's not true repentance. True repentance is doing an about face, turning around, going in the other direction, owning, the, owning their sin, realizing that they indeed um, did this, taking ownership of it, um, confessing it to the Lord, confessing it to you, asking for true forgiveness. And then you can start to see the fruit of them walking in a different direction. You know, that same biblical counselor that I just love has an equation where she says, forgiveness plus repentance 
equals a restored relationship. That was the case in my marriage. My husband did truly repent and I saw the fruit in that. So I knew it was real over time. And I truly forgave from the heart where I wasn't bringing it up again all the time, like holding it against him. I was truly forgiven, gave it to God. And so it was like, um, that was between me and the Lord, whether or not my husband ever repented, I needed to forgive. But my husband did repent, and so we have that re restored relationship. Sometimes the other person won't repent. Um, it's still our responsibility and commandment from the Lord to forgive. But then, as I said before, we take them off our hook and put them on God's hook. Now it's between them and the Lord. If they haven't repented, you might need a time of separation, like my husband and I had, where they either come to a place of true repentance or they might walk away but the lord says that uh, that's on them if if the unbeliever if the wants to walk away if your spouse is walking away from the marriage and there's nothing you can do about it um you're supposed to you're supposed to let them go but continue to pray for them continue to pray earnestly for their soul because God showed me it's more, it was more important to pray, to um, be concerned about my husband's soul than it was to even be about saving the marriage. And um, so forgiveness is that huge key. Uh, but you can't ultimately control what your spouse does, what your husband does. If they repent or not, that's between them and the Lord. Um, so that will determine whether your relationship is restored. But you can forgive. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it's forgiving things all the time. Um, you know, I, I often have to take things uh, that Tim does or says that, that hurt me, and sometimes God will call me to speak the truth in love and speak to him about it. Other times, he'll just have me um, forgive that offense and stop dwelling on it and uh, give it to the Lord and uh, forgive from my heart and um realize that there's so many things I'm sure my husband is forgiving me yeah, of and uh, move on from that. So there's so much to talk about forgiveness. It's hard to, to sum it up here, but I hope that that, that gives a start. Um, number nine is a, a tough one um, to embrace the sexual relationship in the marriage. Um, this might be extremely hurtful for people that have made it maybe come from psychosexual abuse. Um, if so, I have amazing study to recommend um, called Hope Ahead. And that same biblical counselor that I was telling you about, she co-wrote that book. Her name is Barb Mulvey and Chris Paulson. And they both wrote that book um, because it comes out of Barb's, um, Barb's experience with um, sexual sin, her father, uh, it was incest, her father. Um, raped her most uh, as a young child and just having to um, overcome that and how difficult that is. Um, so there's that's an extreme example of of how hard it can be to have a, a healthy sexual relationship in marriage. If so, I, I highly encourage you to, if you've had that in your past, to, to really um, look into that and get help for that. Um, that Hope Ahead book is incredible for that in that regard. Um, and then if you've been sinned against, um, betrayed, it's really hard to come back together again sexually. I struggled with this. Um, when I first came back to Tim, um, there were times I just wanted to throw up every time I had to have sex with him. And I say had to have, it wasn't, it was just out of um, honoring the Lord that I was doing it, um, coming back together with him because I I knew that God calls us to um, to honor that sexual relationship and to and to um, keep it going. And I knew it was it was an important aspect, especially for my husband, because that's where he felt the most loved. Uh, but I, honestly, when it first happened to me, I just I didn't want to. I mean, you can imagine. You know, I just would picture him with the prostitutes that he was with, and um, it would just make me sick. But over time, I just kept giving that to the Lord and would ask for his help um, during it. And over time, um, things improved. Um, my husband is really good about understanding how to pleasure me. 
So, and that's so important. You know, God says that sex is for pleasure for both the male and the female and that he designed it and it's supposed to be a beautiful thing. And when it's, when it's right, it is, it's a beautiful thing. And I'm, I'm there now and I, I love that aspect of our marriage and, um, but don't be afraid to um, address that with your husband. And if you've had hurt in the past that needs to be overcome, help him have, tell him, be honest and um, get into those Bible studies. It'll help you overcome, um, talk to him about it if he's open. And, um, and then if you've never had pleasure in your, in your sexual relationship, if you just feel like it's for him and just hurry up and get it over with, you know, you really need to, um, talk to the Lord and talk to your husband about that. And there's some tools to help. There's a ministry called Authentic Intimacy by Dr. Julie Slattery. Um, and she has written some books called, there's one, Passion Pursuit, What Kind of Love Are You Making? And 25 Questions You're Afraid to Ask About Love, Sex, and Intimacy. Um, I've Tim and I have had the pleasure of um, being able to um, be on a podcast with her and I had my story in a book that she wrote with uh, eight other women, and it's called um, Surprised by the Healer. And that really deals with the sexual relationship as well. So if you struggle in that area, I, I recommend those resources. And to really get to the bottom of it, because um, sex is meant as a gift, um, is given as a gift by God. And if it doesn't feel like that, um, you know, just press into the Lord and get into these studies and figure out um, how to get to that place, find the healing that you need and get to that place where it is a pleasure and for both of you, not just for him. Um, number 10 and the final point I want to share is to open up. And that is um, share your struggles with someone you trust to help you through this. You know, it helps so much to know that you're not alone. Um, it helps so much. And I, and I do a conference for women called the real conference. And that's where we, it's about brokenness in all areas of women's lives. And just by sharing our testimonies, it helps others know that they're not alone and that, um, and, and that, uh, there's others that have been walked in their shoes before them. And so with me and my experience of infidelity um, with the prostitutes and the pornography and all that that I've experienced. Um, I share that openly with others in hopes that they can find um, freedom and healing in the Lord as well. And it's amazing. I've watched women um, who are afraid to share something in their lives and they open up and share and how free that has been for them. Um, it just helps them to know that they're not alone. And it starts to, it's like when you have a bad dream and it's in darkness and then even the, the sunshine, the light from the day starts to um, disperse that darkness and makes start it to make the bad dream go away. It's the same when we, when we get what's hidden in darkness out into God's light for him to heal. There's so much healing as we share and get that out because when it's, stuffed inside it grows and it festers and it can just um, get worse over time and so we really need to be able to share so there might be someone that you can share with that you trust um, and that if it gets to the point where you can actually share openly with your spouse that's all the better because that will draw you closer to one another if he can listen to you um, and listen to what you're struggling with and and you can look at it together and, and, and work on it together. You know, God intends for marriage to be a team where we're on the same side um, facing our enemy, facing um, the world and its issues. We're supposed to be on the It's like being on the same side of a table looking at the problem on the other side of the table rather than the, each of you on each side of the table, um, you know, looking at the problem and the other person might be that you might feel that they're the problem instead you come around to the same side of the table and you look at the problem the issue together so if you can be open with your spouse or be open with someone um, and have that safe place to share your struggles it really will it really will help so those are the 10 points i wanted to share with you and the bottom 
line of all of this is that it's so important to get into God's word and apply it to your life. Actually start putting it into practice and you'll see the changes. That's what I've done in my marriage and uh, it's made all the difference. Um, that's where the power comes from. So I, I encourage you to maybe um, keep a journal, keep track of your progress, write these, these, these things out. I journal with the Lord every day. It's like I write down everything that happened to me in the day. I, that's where I write down things that I got from my daily um, quiet time with him. And, uh, and then I, I kind of ask, stop and ask God to, what, what would you say to me? What do you have to tell me this day? And I write down what I think he's saying. And, and it's in these, those times, that's the relationship that I have with the Lord. And that's where my strength comes from, is from the relationship with him, the truth of his word and applying it to my life and my marriage. So I hope these things have helped. Um, we'll have a time where we can do questions and answers. Uh, it's definitely a lot to talk about, a lot to fit into a short amount of time, but I hope some of these things have helped. I'll have a handout for you. And, um, and again, the time that you can ask questions and you can also email me at any time. I'll give you that address as well. So may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you his peace. May he do a mighty work in your marriage as you give your whole life to him and trust him with the outcome. Bless. Hello. I'm answering questions now that are coming through. Woohoo. <laughs> wow, Amy. Um, so powerful and uh, such richness and so. Uh, thankful for your notes that you um, also gave to all the uh, panelists or the attendees. If you didn't find them, you can um, look for them on our website at daughtersunited.org under our resources. So um, that will be, um, the link is somewhere. I'll try to repost that link as well. So, okay. I know you do have some questions. Yeah, I was a... Uh... It was how is the uh, pornography addressed? And um, so that is a deep, deep seated sin that can, um, that men, I think almost every man on planet earth struggles with. Um, and it's where, where you take it and how it gets lodged in your heart. Um, so, Tim was very young when he was uh, exposed to pornography. He was nine, nine years old, and that's uh, unfortunately common as well. Um, it was the form, in the form of Playboy and stuff like that. And uh, the thing with pornography is it, it's, never, it's never enough. It's always a lust for more and more and more. So for him, it led to, um, it just kept leading down this slippery slope of worse and worse things. And but what needed to be understood and addressed is that that was his go-to when he was in pain. And that's really, really common in men is that, especially when they have a distant relationship with their fathers and they don't have a good relationship with their fathers, they can't talk about emotional things. They can't be themselves there. And, and, and his father was, was, um, was abusive and they didn't have this close relationship. It's very common that men turn to pornography for their, uh, I call it their security blanket, their soothing. That's their go-to. Like, um, I don't know, some people might go to food, uh, to chocolate, to, I mean, anything, you know, or to drugs. His go-to was, um, was pornography and that's where he, he, he found comfort so you can imagine that over time that becomes stronger and stronger of a stronghold and the way that, that he overcame he he had he went to a counselor for a while and then um the best thing that happened was him just truly getting into the word of god and the more he understood about the lord 
the less of a struggle it was and the less the, the temptation lessened over time. And he's told me over and over that me being open in our sexual relationship, the healthy sexual relationship in our marriage has helped him in that area for it to lessen over time, to get less of a pull for him. But it's not an overnight fix. It's not an instant. It's, it's a stronghold that has to be addressed and the husband has to own it and see it as sin and ask and want to be the Lord to get him to overcome it. It's like a drug addiction, but it's even stronger. I've been told, you know, sexual addiction is the strongest pull, even more than heroin or any other drug. So, and it starts with pornography and those images, and then it just it, it drags you down and you take steps. He would have never imagined himself going to prostitutes. And yet he took that. He just kept taking steps because it, it's insatiable. Pornography will never, it will never satisfy. It will always just keep pulling on you. So it really has to come down to the man seeing it for what it is and saying, I want your freedom, Lord. I want you. And the more he presses into the Lord and presses into his word and and, and, and if, if, he, if as, your, as a spouse, you can do this and own it together, you know, he would come home from seeing things that he, you know, seeing images of women in their spandex, which is a, a struggling point for him. And he would come home and tell me, and at, used, at first it would be like, well, what do you, you know, what are you looking at him for? And then I would be like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You didn't, you weren't even looking for that. You were at the grocery store, you know, you were, and I'm sorry that, that you have that and that that's a struggle. And I would pray for him and just me coming alongside him and not, not getting on his case about it and saying, we're in this together. We're going to fight, fight this together. And I'm here for you and I'll pray for you. And uh, so it's, it, but it's real, it's very real. And it does, it, it actually can chemically change their brains. So it's, it's a very, very real struggle. But I think the biggest thing is that they have to own it as sin and want, want the Lord's help to overcome and then press into the Lord. Well, Amy, you are unmasking such a huge topic here and helping us understand um, the men in our lives, right? And um, the other really cool thing that you shared, and the Lord helped me to see this point as well, is that I needed to see my husband as a son of God, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. and, and with all the frailties, the hurts, um, literally as a, as a little boy, an injured little boy that, you know, when I saw what God saw, he helped me to, like you're saying, let him off the hook and put him on God's hook, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that really truly helped, um, through that process. So uh, anything else you want to share about forgiveness? I know this is a big one. <laughs> it's a huge, it's a huge, huge topic, but, um, again, I hope the main point that that is taken away is that that's that is our act of obedience to the Lord okay so it's not that they that our husband deserves our forgiveness we don't deserve God's forgiveness I mean let's just break it down to that um it's you know God is asking us to do the hard things this is where our growth comes from on a personal level on our spiritual level the way that we grow and mature in the Lord is doing the hardest things that he calls us to do. And our obedience, he says it over and over again in his word. If you love me, you will obey me. Now, if you back that up and say it conversely, you're not obeying me. You must not love me. Ouch. Ouch. So that obedience is huge. You know, God says obedience is better than sacrifice to him. So this is where we grow the most. It is not something we feel like doing. It's not what we want to do in our flesh. Believe me, these things, but by doing them, there is blessing and there's growth and there's healing. 
That's so good, Amy. Wow. Can you just close us out with a prayer over these um, women and men watching? Mm -hmm. because, um, it's it's so needed. Thank you. Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, Lord. We acknowledge that um, in this world, as your word says, there will be many troubles, but not to fear because you've overcome the world. And Lord, I pray for each and every one that was watching, Lord, and and just that you, something that was said that's from you will pierce their heart and will start to help and bring healing into their lives and, and help them in any area of struggle that they have. Help them to know that you're sovereign, you're in control, no matter what's going on, that nothing is too hard or impossible for you and that they're not alone. So Father, I just pray for healing and redemption and growth in every single person watching, Lord. And I pray that you ultimately are glorified for all that you do in each of our lives. Lord, show yourselves strong in their lives and may there be great healing in Jesus' name. Amen. There you go. Thank, yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Love you, sister. Can't wait to connect. Can't wait to all connect right. again soon. God bless for all you're doing. Love you. Thank you. Love you. We're going to take a short break here on Daughters United, and we're coming back at 11 o'clock with um, The Gift with Mary Whitman Ortiz. Okay, we will see you soon, and if you are on the um, webinar, you can catch us there, and prayerfully, we will be back up on a 100-year gathering as well. All right. God bless you. Mm -hmm.